So good morning, everyone. This is the the paper I am going to, to present. This is uh, a joint paper by Pedro Clavigo, Clavigo, who unfortunately could not come to the conference with Lee Pochon and myself. And what we do is using a non-linear econometric approach to analyze the plasmatic needs in the United States. And please follow us on Twitter. We use it a lot, so we like to, to have people liking and commenting on our tweets. I, I, I stick to Twitter. <laughs> I, I don't want to give Elon Musk that. It's more. It'll be forever. <laughs> So I will skip the next generation. Yeah. <laughs> generation. I, I skip a few slides because I, I think at this point there's no no need to explain what is the past net anymore. And I'll go straight to to our economic approach. So what we do is use US quarterly time series data from 1968 to 20, and we use three three variables: the past net index, capacity utilization, and labor share. I will show the details soon. So the idea here is to have a threshold uh, vector of regressive model. I will explain that very soon to see how the past net index affects labor share and capacity utilization. And we took the data from the OECD and the Saint Louis Federal Reserve. In the past net index, we use long term real interest rate minus labor productivity. And as a measure of the long term real interest rate, we take the 10 year government bond interest rate. And to make it a real interest rate, we use the CPI, it's good in energy, and we take the labor productivity uh, time series from the St. Louis Fed. I think this is output per worker. I think. That uh, I don't remember exactly. And the capacity utilization is the, the time series that the same use that also uses. And the labor share. So for the labor share, that's the for our workers. So these are the, the time series we, we have. Just to have a quick look at the series in itself before the econometrics. So this is the net index. So let me just go back here. We Compute the past net index as you can see with labor productivity along with the way uh, as loved ones that have that proposal. At the, at the end of the paper, we redo all of the econometric exercises with that other past net index. The results are quite the same, they are very similar. So, here in the presentation, I will just skip that other part that we have done as a rules. Check, and this is the past net index from 68 to last year. And here we have the capacity utilization and it's a uh, variation year over year. So it's this quarter data, so a quarter over a quarter a year ago. And this is the labor share also the change year over, over year. So these are the, the time series we use. And before the, the bar model, we just test the, to, to have like a dialogue with the literature on the positive index, we test for structural breaks in mean and variance. Basically, to, to have a conversation with Sekarecha's paper in which he, he suggests four different regimes for the US economy. And, and among the many variables he uses for explaining these regimes, one of them is the positive index. And what he he does is identify four different regimes. With the tests using the, the, the whole algorithm, we find evidence for these study, and we do not find evidence for this one. Sorry, not for that. Don't take it to the person in part. <laughs> and this is what we find for the positive okay. metrics that are two structural breaks in the mean, which breaks three different regimes, one from 68 to 79, one from 79 to 97, and another one from 97 onwards, which fit basically with the these three regimes that Mario has inspired in this paper, the Canadian era, which according to to the Peron algorithm for the United States actually goes up to 79 and then starts the monetarist age, which the, the, the methodology says it goes up to 1997, and then the inflation targeting regime with, with the flexible inflation targets. Maybe there is something because there is a break in variance here in 2009, which quite coincides with 
with the other data that that Martin is suggesting. So maybe three regimes with breaks in the mean and the other regime with the breaking factors. And one break in the mean for the labor share and no breaks in the mean for the capacity, which is and now to the to the bar model, we have a specific ordering of the variables, which is theoretic, theoretically driven. First, the positive index, because this is the variable you want to, to have the, the shot and the computer analyzes, and then this goes to the labor share because we believe that the positive index will create a, a change in income distribution, and the income distribution will translate into aggregate demand and then capacity utilization. If we have more income going to the labor share, because they at least theoretically they have a higher consumption propensity, there will be higher demand and higher capacity utilization. The opposite if the labor share goes down. What we use here is uh, a more, I would say, fancy econometric technique. So this is federal part. So if you have questions regarding the specific specificities of the methodology, I will not be able to, to go very I'll well. I'll answer them. Okay, so maybe <laughs> those who take those questions. But basically, what is a threshold uh, viral model? It is uh, intended to variables that you believe you have one kind of impacts in the economy if it goes above a certain level and a different or the opposite effect if it goes below a certain level, which is exactly what the positive index is. Because if it is at zero, there is no income going away or from the tier, so the, the, the shares, the income shares are, are constant. If the positive index is positive, there is income going to the tiers, and if it's negative, it's away from the tiers. So that's precisely what a threshold vector of regressive model wants to capture, like the different uh, effects if the variable is up or below a certain a certain value. And more specifically, what it does is sort of a dummy variable and it says say estimates one uh, vector from one, one set of parameters if the variable is above this threshold value and it turns to zero and this one turns to one if it is below the, the value. We can uh, say to the model what the value is, what the threshold value is. We can like run it and say like the threshold value is zero because in theory, the, the Bazinet index, the threshold is zero. But we uh, do not impose such restriction in, in the model. But we let the model estimate the threshold by himself and it's not actually in zero, but it's close. So what the model estimates is that this threshold is at 0 0.6. So it's, if it goes above 0 0.6, then it's income going to rentiers, and below 0 0.6 is income going away from rentiers. So it's slightly different from what in theory we, we would have. So we can, uh, 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 that's my opinion. I think we can still stick to the, to the basic idea, but it's nice to, you don't impose the restriction in the model and let it do his thing and see what happens. And it turns out it's almost the same thing of the, that the theory says. And this is the the, the Bazinet index again, with a little bit clearer. That, that are, you probably cannot see because it's here, it's too, but there are gray, gray shaded areas here. And if you go to the paper, you will see it better. We shaded the areas in which the Bazinet index. Oh, there you can see. Oh, thank you. Emma. So you can see here. So those shaded areas, they are shaded when the Bazinet index is below the threshold of 0 0.6, and it's not shaded when it is above the 0 0.6. And now I go to the input response functions. There is a lot going on, so I will just give you a quick idea here. We have two two sets of fibers. This one and this one, because we test for a, a positive shock to the positive index and a negative shock to the positive index to see if there is a difference. And there is a difference. If the positive index goes up. It has one effect, and if it goes down, it's not the same effect with the Opposite sign, it's, it's of a different magnitude too. And we have here, because it is a threshold var, we have different 
impulse response functions. So if we have the pass netting that's above in a positive value, we have what is in red. So the red solid line is in what we call the delta five. We can show this one in red is when the pass netting is, is in the negative value. So it's when income is going away from the negative. And the black dotted line is when we are in the negative base division. So when the pass netting is in the positive value. And you cannot see here, but you can see here that we have the confidence interval, it's the, this red shaded area around the, the one of the regimes and the dotted line around this, this dotted line. So this is for capacity utilization and this one for the labor share to one positive standard deviation structure, the PI. What is the size of one standard deviation? It's 2.53. Uh, so for example, if the net index is at two, this shock is that the positive index go from two to four point five two. That's the size of the shock. One of the shortcomings of of this is that this is a shock to the positive index. So we assume here that this is to translate that to a monetary policy discussion. We assume that this is something going on with the interest rate, but that restriction is not on, on the econometric methodology. So it can as well be a shock to inflation or to labor productivity or a combination of the three variables. So it can be the, any of those combinations or combinations of two of the three variables. So it can be many things. So this cre can create some problems in, with interpretation, but if in the end it's changes in, in the fuzz network. So if the fuzz network increases, so if it increases, the idea is that there is more income going to the retiers. And what we have here is one effect if we are already at the rentier bias regime. And another if we are in the debtors bias regime. So if the positive net index is already positive and it increases even further, we have this dotted line here. So capacity utilization drops almost 1.5%. If we are instead in the negative value from the positive net index, and it increases, but it stays there, but it's an increase anyway. The capacity utilization drops, also drops, but drops less. It's like 0 0.8. So it's a, a smaller reduction, but a reduction. But if the positive index is positive and goes even further, the reduction in capacity utilization is. And for the labor share, we have. Uh, the same effects, but they are statistically significant, but in, in my view, they are small in, in, in the magnitude. <laughs> but anyway, since our ordering of variables is from positive net index to the labor share and then to capacity utilization, and it shows that it is uh, statistically significant, it, it is high enough to have uh, an effect on the capacity utilization. And here again, we have to make in the dotted line the positive net index in the positive level and going even further. And this is the effect here the labor share drops, but that's 0 0.15. And if it was negative and increases and stays in, in a negative part, we have uh, a smaller decrease, but that decrease nonetheless. So this is for uh, an increase in the positive net index. We have here for a um, uh, negative shock to the positive net index. So if the positive net index goes down, in theory, you have less income going to the rentiers or more income going away from them. And again, we have the, the two regimes. We have here in the red line, it's the same as, as before the left or minus region. So here is the, the positive net index is below zero and it decreases even further. So we have that capacity utilization increases. And it's connected to this uh, similar to the other region. If you see here, we have the dotted line going close to 1.5. And here we have the red line going close to 3. So if the positive index is at the negative part, and in the negative part, it drops further, we have an increase in the capacity utilization. So less income going to the materials or more income going to the other income groups in the foster economic, foster aggregate demand and positive
if the Fasenet index is in the positive value, then drops, but stays in the, the positive value. The capacity utilization also increases, but increases less. Yeah. And we have here again for the labor share, they are statistically significant, but small. So we have what we have as this takeouts or conclusions from here. Fuzzy net shots, they have strong effects in capacity utilization, stronger than on the labor share. But anyway, I think we have here evidence for our ordering of variables and that fuzzy net index affect income distribution, and then it goes to aggregate the net. And increases in the fuzzy net index have strong negative effect if we are in the retired bias regime. So if we are already in a regime in which the retired are getting a higher share, and if the fuzzy net index goes even further, we have the stronger negative effects on aggregate. And the opposite happens if we are in the debtor bias regime. So if the fuzzy net index is at the negative value and it drops even further, we have that uh, this decrease in the fuzzy net index will have a positive effect on income distribution and on aggregate. The next chart columns of our approach is, as I said in the beginning, what is driving the fuzzy net index shot. So we, it can be either only a, a something happening with the interest rate or something only with inflation or only with the productivity or something with, or a combination of two of those three variables or the three going to be in, in, in the same direction. And because of this, how can we relate that to monetary policy? Because it can be something like it can be a, com a combination of changes in productivity and inflation with the monetary, uh, with the interest rate being kept constant. So uh, I have some, some, some doubts that if we can relate that always with monetary policy. And some relation with the personal income distribution, this is a concern that I had because. We, the labor share can be like constant and we still can have a worsening of the income distribution because we might have the workers at the bottom of the income ladder receiving less wages and the workers at the top receiving more. So we have a, a, an increase in income inequality with a constant labor share. So there are more things going on than only the, the factor share. And include more robust and checks to the same for rising are, are really precise. We conducted only one so far, which is building the alternative fuzzy net index. And then the results are quite the same. The, the, the magnitude is a little bit smaller, but the, the, the direction is quite the same. And thank you.